The storm hit hard and fast, catching us off guard. The wind whipped through the trees, making the branches thrash violently. I was in the kitchen, washing up after dinner, while Lily was upstairs finishing her homework. Our parents had gone to visit relatives, leaving us alone on the farm. As the storm intensified, the lights flickered once, twice, and then went out completely. The house plunged into darkness, and I heard Lily's hurried footsteps coming down the stairs. Emma, the power's out. She called, her voice laced with worry. I know, I replied, trying to keep my voice calm. Let's get some candles. We knew the house well, having grown up here, so even in the dark, we navigated the rooms with ease. We found the candles and matches in the pantry and quickly lit them, placing them around the living room. Do you think Mom and Dad are okay? Lily asked, her eyes wide in the candlelight. I'm sure they're fine, I said, more to reassure myself than her. The storm will pass soon. We would huddled together on the couch, listening to the storm rage outside. The wind howled and the rain pounded against the windows. Just as I was starting to relax, there was a loud knock at the door. Lily and I exchanged nervous glances. Who could that be? She whispered. I don't know. I replied, my heart racing. Stay here. I'll check. I approached the door cautiously, peering through the peephole. All I could see was a dark, rain-soaked figure. I hesitated, then called out, Who is it? Please. I need help. A man's voice replied, sounding desperate. My car broke down. Can I use your phone? Something about his voice set off alarm bells in my head. I'm sorry, we don't have any power or phone service, I said, hoping he would leave. There was a pause, then another knock, more insistent this time. Please, it's an emergency. I looked back at Lily, who was watching me with wide, scared eyes. Stay here, I mouthed to her, and she nodded. I took a deep breath and cracked the door open, keeping the chain on. The man was drenched, his eyes wild. Before I could say anything, I noticed movement behind him. Two more figures approaching. Panic surged through me, and I slammed the door shut, throwing the deadbolt into place. Lily, we need to hide, I said, my voice trembling. We ran into the kitchen our hearts pounding. What's going on? Asked Lily, her voice shaking. There are at least three of them, I said, trying to stay calm. We need to sit tight and find a way to protect ourselves. We knew every nook and cranny of the house, so we quickly grabbed the largest kitchen knives and moved to our parents' bedroom, where we felt safest. We need to get help, Lily whispered, clutching her knife tightly. I nodded. Maybe the landline will work. But when I picked up the phone, there was no dial tone. The storm must have taken out the lines. Suddenly, we heard the sound of breaking glass from downstairs. My heart felt like it would burst out of my chest. They're inside, I whispered. We listened as the intruders moved through the house, their footsteps heavy and deliberate. We had to think fast. Let's hide in the attic. I whispered. They might not check there. The attic entrance was in the hallway outside our parents' bedroom. We waited until the men were on the other side of the house, then quietly slipped out and pulled down the attic ladder. We climbed up and gently pushed the ladder back up, praying they wouldn't hear us. The attic was dark and dusty, filled with old furniture and boxes. We found a corner behind some old trunks and huddled together trying to stay as quiet as possible. We could hear the men downstairs, their voices muffled but growing louder as they approached the bedrooms. My grip on the knife tightened, and I could feel Lily shaking beside me. I don't want to die, she whispered, tears streaming down her face. We won't, I said, trying to sound confident. We'll get through this. Suddenly, we heard two men enter our parents' bedroom, their frustration evident. There's no one here, one of them said. Mark, check the attic while I go down to the basement, and John checks the garage. Our hearts sank as we heard him lower the ladder. 
we held our breath, realizing there was nowhere left to run. When the intruder climbed into the attic, I knew we had to act. I signaled Lily to stay hidden and crept to the other side of the attic, hoping to distract him. I knocked over a box, creating a loud noise. Over here, the man shouted, moving towards the sound. I waited until he got closer, then jumped out of hiding and slashed at him with a knife. He cried out in pain and stumbled back, giving us a chance to escape. I grabbed Lily's hand, and we dashed down the ladder, racing through the house. We burst through the back door and into the storm, the wind and rain battering us. The old dirt road to our neighbor's house was barely visible. We ran as fast as we could, the storm making each step a struggle. Come on, Lily, we're almost there. I yelled over the wind. After what felt like an eternity, we saw the lights of our neighbor's house in the distance. Relief washed over me, giving me the strength to keep going. We reached the front door and pounded on it desperately. Help, please help us, I shouted. The door swung open, and Mr. Thompson, our neighbor, stood there, his face filled with concern. What happened? He asked, ushering us inside. Men, in our house, I panted, barely able to get the words out. Mr. Thompson didn't hesitate. He called the police immediately, and within minutes, sirens pierced the stormy night. The police arrived and quickly headed to our farm, apprehending the intruders who were still inside. Later, we learned from the police that the men were escapees from the nearby prison. They had taken advantage of the storm to make their break and had sought shelter in our house. Our parents returned the next day, and we clung to them, grateful to be safe. The farm, usually a place of comfort, now held memories of a night filled with terror. But we had survived, and that was all that mattered. The rain was coming down in sheets, making it nearly impossible to see the road ahead. My wipers struggled against the downpour, and I squinted through the windshield, searching for any sign of the next turn. It was late, and I was already behind schedule, eager to reach my destination before midnight. That's when I saw her, a figure standing on the roadside, drenched and shivering. Her clothes clung to her like a second skin, and her hair was plastered to her face. I felt a pang of sympathy. No one deserved to be out in this weather. I pulled over and rolled down the window. Do you need a ride? I called out over the roar of the storm. She looked up, her eyes wide, and filled with a mixture of relief and something else I couldn't quite place. Yes, please, she said, her voice barely audible above the rain. I unlocked the door, and she climbed in, dripping water onto the seat. Thank you, she murmured, hugging herself for warmth. No problem, I replied, turning the heat up a notch. Where are you headed? She hesitated, glancing out the window. Just anywhere away from here, she said softly. I nodded and started driving again. My curiosity peaked, but not wanting to press her for details. We drove in silence, the storm outside only growing worse. As we drove, I couldn't help but steal glances at my passenger. She was young, probably in her early twenties, with a haunted look in her eyes. Something about her made me uneasy, but I chalked it up to the weather and the late hour. Are you from around here? I asked, trying to make conversation. She shook her head. No, just passing through, she replied curtly. I noticed her clothes were simple, but well-worn, as if she'd been traveling for a while. There was a tension in her posture, a kind of readiness to bolt at any moment. I decided to drop the subject and focus on the road. After a few more miles, she finally spoke again. Thank you for picking me up. It's been a rough night. No problem. It's not safe to be out in this storm, I said, trying to reassure her. She gave me a tight smile, but it didn't reach her eyes. Something about her seemed off, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I kept my eyes on the road, the uneasy feeling growing stronger with each passing mile. 
It wasn't long before I began to notice strange things about her. She would glance nervously out the windows, as if expecting someone, or something, to appear at any moment. She flinched at every thunderclap, her fingers digging into the seat. Is everything all right? I asked, my concern growing. She nodded quickly, but her eyes betrayed her fear. Yes, just, not a fan of storms. I tried to push the unease aside, focusing on driving through the treacherous weather. But then, I saw it, a flash of something metallic in her bag, a glint of metal that looked suspiciously like a knife. My heart skipped a beat. What's that? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. She looked down at her bag, then back at me, her expression unreadable. Just something for protection, she said quietly. I nodded, not sure what to say. The tension in the car was palpable, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I had made a terrible mistake. The storm showed no signs of letting up, and the road stretched endlessly before us. The girl remained silent, staring out the window, lost in her thoughts. My mind raced with possibilities, each one more disturbing than the last. That's when the radio crackled to life. A news bulletin cut through the static, the announcer's voice urgent. We interrupt this program to bring you a special alert. Authorities are searching for a young woman who escaped from a local psychiatric clinic earlier tonight. She is considered dangerous and should not be approached. If you see her, contact the police immediately. My blood ran cold. I glanced at the girl beside me, her face pale and eyes wide. She had heard it too. Is that you? I asked, my voice barely more than a whisper. She didn't answer, her silence speaking volumes. My hands tightened on the steering wheel, my mind racing with panic. What had I gotten myself into? I knew I had to act fast. My phone was on the dashboard, within arm's reach. I just needed to get to it without alarming her. Listen, I said slowly, trying to keep my voice calm. I think we should find a place to stop for the night. Maybe there's a motel up ahead. She looked at me, her expression unreadable. Maybe, she said softly. Or maybe we should keep driving. I forced a smile, my heart pounding in my chest. Yeah, maybe you're right. I reached for my phone, but before I could grab it, she lunged at me, her hands clawing at my arm. No, she screamed, her voice filled with desperation. You can't call them. You don't understand. The car swerved wildly, and I fought to keep it on the road. Let go, I shouted, trying to shake her off. She was surprisingly strong, her grip like iron. Please just listen to me, she cried, tears streaming down her face. In that moment, I realized she was truly terrified, but I couldn't afford to take any chances. With a burst of strength, I managed to wrench my arm free and grab my phone. I dialed 911, my fingers trembling. 911, what's your emergency? The operator's voice crackled through the speaker. I need help, I said, my voice shaking. There's a girl in my car. She escaped from a psychiatric clinic and... The phone was knocked out of my hand, clattering to the floor. The girl stared at me, her eyes filled with a mix of fear and sorrow. Please, she whispered, just let me explain. But it was too late. The sound of sirens filled the air, growing louder with each passing second. The police were on their way, and I knew there was no turning back. As the blue and red lights flashed behind us, I felt a mixture of relief and dread. The storm raged on, but the real tempest was inside the car, between the two of us. Strangers bound by fear, mistrust, and a night that would change our lives forever. We should have checked the weather forecast. That's what kept running through my mind as the storm bore down on us, turning our camping trip into a fight for survival. The wind howled through the trees and the rain lashed at us, soaking through our clothes and making the forest trail nearly impossible to follow. Sam, are you sure this is the right way? Jess shouted over the storm, 
her voice tinged with panic. I think so, Sam yelled back, though he didn't sound convinced. The map got drenched. I can barely read it. We trudged on, the five of us, Sam, Jess, Mike, Laura, and me, each step more difficult than the last. Darkness was falling, and the temperature was dropping. Just when I thought we might have to huddle under a tree for the night, Mike spotted the roof of the house through the trees. There, he shouted, pointing. A house. It was an old, abandoned house, the kind you'd see in a horror movie. But right now, it was our only hope for shelter. We pushed open the creaking front door and stepped into the house, shaking off the rain. The air inside was musty, and the wooden floorboards groaned under our weight. Despite its outward appearance, the house felt eerily preserved, as if someone had just stepped out for a moment. This place gives me the creeps, Laura muttered, hugging herself. Better than freezing out there, Sam replied, trying to sound reassuring. Let's find some dry clothes and see if we can get a fire going. We split up to explore the house. I headed upstairs with Jess, our flashlights casting long, eerie shadows on the walls. The rooms were filled with old furniture, and it looked like people had been living here recently. Clothes were strewn about, and there were half-eaten meals on the tables. Why would anyone leave so suddenly? Jess wondered aloud. I had no answer. Something felt off, but I didn't want to scare her, or myself, more than we already were. We found some blankets and dry clothes in a closet and headed back downstairs. Sam and Mike had managed to get a fire going in the fireplace, and we gathered around it, grateful for the warmth. As we dried off and warmed up, the tension began to ease, replaced by a cautious sense of relief. Our relief was short-lived. As we settled in, Laura found a journal on a dusty coffee table. She flipped it open, her eyes widening as she read. Guys, you need to see this, she said, her voice trembling. We gathered around as she read aloud. The journal belonged to someone named Sarah, and the last entry was dated just two days ago. It described strange noises outside the house, shadows moving in the woods, and a growing sense of dread. She writes that they were planning to leave, Laura said, looking up. We sat in uneasy silence, the crackling fire the only sound. Then Jess gasped, pointing to the window. Did you see that? I turned just in time to see a shadow flit past the window. My heart pounded in my chest. Probably just the wind, I said, trying to convince myself more than anyone else. But deep down, we all knew something wasn't right. Night had fully fallen, and the storm raged on outside. We decided to stick together, staying in the living room where the fire provided some comfort. But the sense of being watched was overwhelming. Maybe we should just leave, Mike said, his voice low. I'd rather take my chances in the storm than stay here. We don't even know where we are, Sam argued. We could get lost and freeze to death. A loud thump on the porch made us all jump. We stared at the door, holding our breath. Another thump, then the doorknob rattled. Someone, or something, was out there. Turn off the lights. I whispered urgently. Maybe they'll think no one's home. We doused the fire and turned off our flashlights, plunging the room into darkness. We huddled together, listening as the door creaked open and footsteps echoed through the house. I held my breath, straining to hear. The footsteps grew closer, then stopped. In the darkness, I felt someone's hand clutch mine tightly. The silence stretched on, suffocating us. Then, the footsteps retreated, and the door closed again. We let out our breath in a collective sigh of relief. What the hell was that? Jess whispered, her voice shaking. I don't know, Sam replied. But we need to get out of here as soon as it's light. We stayed awake the rest of the night, too terrified to sleep. Every creak and groan of the old house set our nerves on edge. Finally, as the first light of dawn filtered through the windows, we gathered our things and prepared to leave. We should stick together, I said. 
no one goes off alone. We stepped outside, the storm reduced to a light drizzle. The forest was eerily silent, and the path we had come in on was barely visible. We started walking, trying to retrace our steps. That's when I saw it, a figure standing at the edge of the woods, watching us. My heart leaped into my throat. Guys, look, I whispered. The figure didn't move, just stood there. We backed away slowly, our eyes never leaving the watcher. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it melted back into the trees. We didn't wait to see if it would return. We ran, pushing through the underbrush, ignoring the branches that scratched at our faces and arms. Fear gave us speed, and soon we stumbled onto a dirt road. There, Sam shouted, pointing to a small cabin in the distance. We sprinted towards it, praying for safety. We reached the cabin and pounded on the door. An elderly man opened it, his eyes widening in surprise. What's all this then? Please, I gasped. We need help. Someone was following us. He ushered us inside and locked the door behind us. You're safe now, he said, but you're lucky to be alive. That house you found, no one's lived there for years, and those who do don't last long. His words sent a shiver down my spine. We had escaped, but the memory of that night and the watcher in the woods would haunt us forever.